that one. Amen. He's a chain breaker, isn't he? He breaks our chains. If you bow your heads with me, let's have a pray right now that as we open your word once again, as we look at the message that you have for us this morning, that, that the, the message would come uh, not, not from me, but from you. Father, I pray that we would be ready to receive it with open hearts and open minds, and we would be willing and, and, and waiting for you to change us, to be more like you. I pray in your name. Amen. Our, our presentation today is, is actually uh, kind of in the middle of a little series I'm doing, six parts. Today is number four, and uh, today is very important because we're kind of transitioning here. We've gone through three, and now we're number four. If you haven't been here for all of them, uh, we can probably get you uh, the recording of that if you'd like it. But this is the thing. If, if we don't really understand what we've discussed in last week's sessions, the ones leading up to today, and this week's and next week's, we're going to get a little bit lost, okay? So I'm going to spend a few minutes, just a couple of minutes, reviewing what we've learned uh, last week, okay? Now, I'm wondering if there's anybody here who uh, can fill in those blanks for us. I had this up last week, and it goes like this. The Bible opens with blank and closes with the silencing of that blank, little quiz to see who's paying attention, all right? Anybody know? The Bible opens with accusation and it closes with the silencing of that accusation. That's at least one that's paying attention. It's a good thing. She's a teacher. She knows how it is. We also spent a little bit of time last week talking about the so-called satanic verses in Scripture, those verses that sort of tear back the veil between the seen and the unseen, and they give us a picture into the world behind the world that we see and discern with our senses. You guys remember those? Remember that? Okay, and the Bible describes a rebellion, an, ange an angelic rebellion against the government of God, but particularly against the character of God, right? Against the character of God. And there are a number of primary passages in Scripture that sort of reveal who this Satan figure is. You may recall from last week as well that the word Satan itself, the one that we use like a proper name, like we would say Rennie or Matt, is actually a transliteration of the Hebrew word that literally means an opponent or an adversary or an accuser. Okay? That's actually a transliteration. It's a word, a Hebrew word, that means opponent, adversary, or uh, accuser. Okay? Now, if you take a look at these satanic verses on the screen once again, we put this slide up last week as well. You notice that the first of these is Genesis chapter what? Chapter 3, right? And we're going to go back there today. We spent a lot of time there last week. That is, this is where the accusation is initialized, right? It's commenced in Scripture. Uh, and all throughout Scripture, you see these, these little glimpses of a controversy, of a dispute that is taking place between God, uh, God and his government and a systematic accusation against God by the accuser and, and by the opponent. Now, some of these passages are Job 1, Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, Zechariah 3, and then in the New Testament, Matthew 4. And then fascinatingly enough, Scripture closes, it closes with the silencing of that accusation. We looked at that text last week, Revelation 12, verse 10. It says that the accuser of our brethren who accused them before God day and night has been cast down. It's been cast down. So it's a, it's a fascinating sort of uh, meta-narrative of Scripture, okay? A big picture of Scripture to see it opening with an accusation and then it is closing with the silencing of that same accusation. Now, the nature of the accusation against God and his government, you may recall from last week, we used the analogy of a tripod, right? A tripod, three points, Okay. Three points. We use them for all sorts of things. A tripod does not have four or five or six or eight legs, right? It only has three, right? Three legs. And the reason is simple and mathematical. Three points is the fewest number of points that form a plane, right? That's why we have tripods. We use them for everything, don't we? You know, the mic stand here, but I mean, we use them all the time. That's why we have them. It's simple, it's easy, it's quick, and it's stable. It's stable. Right? When you have three points in a plane forming a triangle, you necessarily have stability. I want you to, um, they, you necessarily have stability. You don't have to try and create stability when you have a tripod. It's necessarily there. It's there mathematically. It's there automatically. Are you with me? 
What we discovered about the accusation against God in Genesis chapter 3 was that that accusation is like a tripod of accusations, a tripod of deception, and it rested on three points. The first is in the lower left-hand corner here on the screen. God is unclear, unreasonable, and restrictive. Restrictive. Remember God had said, of every tree of the garden you may eat freely? Right? But when Satan, the accuser, asks the question, he frames the question in such a way as to suggest that, in fact, there was not a vast panorama of freedom, but actually there's a vast panorama of restriction with only a little narrow window of freedom. So the suggestion is that God is unreasonable, that he's restrictive, and that he's unclear. The woman then protested, saying, no, we can eat of the trees, but we can't eat of a certain tree because the day that we eat of that tree, we're going to die. And then the accuser raised his second of the three objections. He says, you will not surely die. You will not surely die. And so there in the lower right-hand corner, the second uh, leg of this tripod of deception, God is dishonest and untrustworthy. Dishonest and untrustworthy. The accuser basically says, God has lied to you. He's lied to you. You've been led to believe something that's not true, right? This is not actual what the way things are going on. God is not only unclear, God is not only restrictive, God is not only unreasonable, but now God is also dishonest and untrustworthy. Are you with me? In short, God lied to you. Well, at this point in the accusation, all we have are two statements of Satan's uh, perspective on the whole thing, okay? These first two ones are, are Satan's perspective. But the third, the nail in the coffin that brings the whole accusation to its climax is the motive that is actually attributed to God for why he's acting this way, okay? Why is God unreasonable? Why is God restrictive? Why is God prohibiting you from eating from all the trees? Why has God been dishonest with you? Why is he not trustworthy? Okay? And then Satan gives the accusation. He says in verse 5 of Genesis chapter 3, he says, let me tell you something, lady. Let me tell you something. Right? God knows that in the day that you eat of this tree right here, you will be like him knowing good and evil. You're going to be like him. And so the third... And the most terrible, the most nefarious part of this satanic accusation is that God is selfish and that God is only looking out for himself. Now, Scripture opens with this. I want you to understand this. This is how Scripture opens. Scripture opens with this basic idea of a great conflict, a, a great dispute, or as Seventh-day Adventists have called it for many, many years, a great controversy, right? Right? And that there is a great conflict over the nature, the government, and the character of God. That's what it's over. You don't have to go to the book of Revelation for that. You don't even have to go to the New Testament for that. All you have to do is go to the third chapter of Scripture, Genesis chapter 3. And I want to remind you of something we said last week. We said if you correctly understand Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3, if you correctly understand the first three chapters, you will very likely correctly understand the rest of Scripture. Very likely. Because almost all of Scripture is actually a commentary on the opening chapters in Genesis. If you get it right in Genesis 1, 2, and 3, you stand a good chance of getting it right in the rest of Scripture. But if you get it wrong in Genesis 1, 2, and 3, well, the opposite is true. You stand a very good chance of getting the rest of Scripture wrong. Are you with me? Okay? Now, with that in mind, who can fill in these blanks for me? We had this on the screen last week, too. Sin is a natural and inevitable consequence of believing a blank picture of blank. A false picture of God, right? A false picture of God, believing a false picture. Now, I want, to just, I want to illustrate this for you. This is absolutely crucial. Let's go back to our tripod illustration just for a moment. In the same way that stability is natural and mathematical consequence, right? This, I, I cannot easily tip this over, right? Stability. On a tripod, it's a natural consequence. It's a mathematical consequence. It is a necessity because you have three points to form a plane, right? It's a natural thing. You don't have to try to make it stable. You don't have to manufacture stability when you have a stable plane, right? So it, it's there automatically. It's there necessarily. Are you with me? It follows necessarily from having three points. It's just, it's just the way it is. Sin... Hear me out on this. Sin follows necessarily and inevitably from a false picture of God. From a false picture of God. 
Which is why you, you may remember from last week, we sometimes think of the eating of the fruit as the real thing, right? We think that's when Eve sinned, right? The moment she bit the, bit the fruit, that, that's, that's when the whole thing happened, right? That's, that's the real thing. But the eating of the fruit came at the end of the conversation, it came at the end of the conversation. It came over at, at the end of something that had already happened. It had already happened. And the thing that had happened, the woman had had a false picture of God inserted into her basic thinking and psychology. In other words, Satan couldn't just go to her in the tree and say, hey, eat, eat, this, eat this fruit from this tree. No, 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 no. He, I mean, there was a work that had to be done before that. Right? There was a work that had to be done before that. To use a computer analogy, she had to have her initial hard drive, her, her initial operating system had to be ejected, it had to be taken out. Because you're not going to get, listen to me carefully, you're not going to get disobedience if you believe that God is good, God is kind, God is gracious, God is merciful, God is looking out for your best interest. I mean, think, who would disobey a God like that if you actually believe that's who God is? You wouldn't. It's illogical. It's illogical. It just doesn't make sense. So what Satan had to do was to eject that basic hard drive, that operating system, and insert a new hard drive and a new operating system. Here's the point. When she begins to think that way, when she starts thinking that way, the actual act of eating the fruit is a natural and inevitable consequence of believing what she believed about God. Does that make sense? Are you with me? Okay. This one's a little harder. This is from last week as well. Not all sin is blank, but all sin is blank in its intent. Does anybody remember that one? Anybody remember it? Not all sin is murder, but all sin is murderous in its intent. Very good. Not all sin is murder. Of course, there's many, many different kinds of sins. But because sin, at the end of the day, is the placement of me and mine and more above, over and above and against God's will, at the end of the day, if you come between me and my desires, while well, I may not actually physically murder you, I can have anger or frustration or annoyances with you in my heart. And Jesus said that's murderous intent. That's murderous intent. That's why Jesus said in John chapter 8 that the devil was a murderer from the beginning, right? He was the father of lies because Jesus could see and the father could see that the inevitable, inevitable outworking of Satan's basic way of thinking would lead to murder. It would lead to murder. This is a quote I put on the screen last week, and I wanted to spend, a, just spend a one moment there. It is Satan's, what is that next word? It is Satan's constant effort to misrepresent the character of God. He causes them to cherish false conceptions of God so that they regard him with, what are those next two words? Fear and hate rather than with love. The cruelty inherent in his own character is attributed to the creator. Now, as I give basic thought to this idea, it's from the book Great Controversy. Uh, when, I, when I look at this, the whole thing boils down to these two words right there. I don't know if you can see it very well. So that. So that. In other words, there's a purpose. There is an intentionality behind this. Why? Why misrepresent God's character? That's, that's the question there. Is it a hobby for him? Is it something he just enjoys doing? Like, why? Why do it? And the paragraph here offers a very interesting answer. It says that he does it for the purpose of destroying God's relationship with his creation. That's why he does it. So that... His creation will relate to him out of fear and hate rather than as he created them out of love. And that's what I want to spend our time together on here today. The purpose is basically to upend the way God's creation thinks about him. And that is, that is at the middle of the controversy that we are all in right now. Who is God? What is he like? Can he be trusted? And how do we know? How do we know? We closed last week with a somewhat provocative statement. I want to see if any of you remember this one. If your internal and emotional picture of God doesn't look like the blank of the Gospels, then your picture is blank. Anybody remember it? If it doesn't look like the Jesus of the Gospels, then your picture's wrong. Now, that's a, that's a little strong for some people maybe to say you're wrong. Well, the truth of the matter is this. Jesus himself said, if you have seen me, you've seen the Father. If you see me, you've seen the Father. So if our basic internal picture and psychology of what God looks like in his character and his nature does not look like the Jesus of the New Testament, then our picture's wrong. Our picture's wrong. 
Now, with that in mind, we're going to sort of launch back into Genesis chapter 3 after Adam and Eve had believed the lie. And there's a great amount of detail here, by the way, that we're skipping over, not because it's unimportant, but because we're trying to keep a basic stream of thought, okay? One fascinating little detail we're not going to spend any time on, really, is Eve was deceived, but Adam clearly, knowingly, and willingly walked into disobedience. In that sense, Adam's sin was greater. The woman was tricked, deceived, hoodwinked, whatever you want to call it, but the man knew exactly what he was getting himself into. He knew that there had been a deception, he knew there had been a deceit, and he knowingly, willingly, voluntarily walked into the situation that he found himself in. He knew it. Shortly, shortly thereafter, we actually ended up, last time in verse 5, we're going to pick it back up in verse 6 uh, on the screen together. Verse 6, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food... That it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Now, Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, is arguably the saddest verse in the entire Bible. The saddest verse in the entire Bible. Can you imagine, especially those of you who are parents, you'll understand this. Can you imagine your children running away from you in fear when you have done nothing to create that fear? Can you imagine that? Can you imagine your children being terrified of you? Your children running from you in fear because of a, a complete misrepresentation and misunderstanding. Can you imagine that? It says that Adam and Eve hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Why, why are they hiding? In one word, why are they hiding? Well, it's the second word right up here. Fear. When God comes down and asks the question, this is exactly what Adam's going to say. Verse 9, we're going to come back to this in a second. Verse 9, it says this. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was what? Afraid. Afraid. Now we're going to spend a little bit of time just kind of unpacking this. Uh, what are they afraid of? Now here, here's where things get very interesting. In verse 7, it says, they knew that they were naked. Right? Now, this is an interesting thing to say here. I've always been cognizant of my own nakedness, right? When I'm naked, I'm fully aware of it. Are you with me, right? If you're naked, you would know it, wouldn't you? It's not like suddenly you just, you're going to work and you get out of the car and you're like, oh, I forgot to get dressed this morning, right? It's, that doesn't happen, right? We are full, we're in our right, we understand when we're clothed and we're not clothed. We're fully aware of that. So why did Moses go to the point of letting us know that after this disloyalty and this disobedience to God, they suddenly had an awareness that they were naked? Why did he put that in there? It's very interesting. Look at the, the last verse of chapter 2, Genesis 2.25. It says, And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. So was there a nakedness before this? Yeah, there was a kind of nakedness, but it was not a, a, a nakedness that would be associated with shame. It was almost as if they were naked and they didn't know it. They didn't know it because there was no shame. There was no guilt. There was no sense of their own nakedness. They didn't, they, there was none of that there. We also have some indications that there may have been some sort of robo light, but they didn't have garments like we wear today, okay? There's, you know, some, some stuff there. But now this is an interesting thing because the very first thing that Scripture says after they sinned is that they had an awareness that they were naked. And with that awareness comes shame and guilt. Shame and guilt. Now watch this. This is a very interesting psychological twist here. Adam and Eve are suddenly feeling naked. They've never had this, they've never had awareness of it. It's just all of a sudden, they're suddenly feeling ashamed and guilty for the transgression that they had just committed against God, right? Their eyes are opened, and their natural intuition when they hear God's voice is to what? Hide. Hide. To run and flee from the presence of God. And the question is why? Had God done anything up to this point that would communicate to them that they should be afraid? The well, answer is no. Nothing. There was no, he had done nothing. So why, what, what are they afraid of? 
And here's the crucial point. Don't miss this. I want you to hear this. If you, if you forget everything I say today, I want you to understand this. Adam and Eve assume. Adam and Eve assume. Now listen very carefully. It's crucial you get this. Adam and Eve assume that their own internal feelings of shame and guilt are actually a reflection of God's attitude towards them. Do you get that? So they are feeling a certain way internally, and when they hear God's voice, they instantaneously and incorrectly assume that God's attitude towards them is actually why they feel the way they presently feel. Are you with me? But here's the remarkable thing as the story unfolds. Do you know why God has come into the garden? To tell them that a way of escape has been made for them in their predicament. In other words, God comes into the garden to reestablish contact and to let them know everything's going to be okay. Everything's going to be okay. To announce the good news and to announce a judgment on the accuser. You, we could say in very simple language, he comes into the garden to preach the gospel. That's why he's there, to announce good news for them. But their internal sense of shame and guilt makes them just sure that God is angry with them. God is out to get them, and so they flee in fear from God. They flee in fear. Now notice what else happens here. With the dawning awareness of nakedness comes the desire to cover. Where formerly they had not needed coverings. It says now in verse 7, they knew they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. The basic essence of this is that they are leaning now not towards dependence on God, but dependence on themselves. We will cover ourselves to protect us from the impenetrable gaze of God himself who is angry with us. <coughs> this is righteousness by works in its most basic form. We will do something that puts us right with God. That'll put us right with God. God is upset with us. God sees our nakedness. God feels our shame. We'll cover ourselves. We'll rise to the occasion and do it, and all will be well. That's what they're doing. In fact, they are going to be covered. And as the Genesis narrative unfolds, they will be covered, but not with, a, not with mere fig leaves of a tree, something that would wilt away, but they will be covered actually in anticipation, by the way, of the death of Jesus with coats of skins, according to Genesis 3.21. Also, their instinct, as part of the fear and shame they are feeling, along with a, a desire to cover themselves, is hiding, hiding. Interestingly, when God finally finds them and confronts them, I want to pick it back up here in verse 9. He, he, he finds them and confronts them. He says this, Then the Lord God called Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the tree and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Now here's accountability. Accountability is now coming to the story. Notice, notice that the man's instinct, he, he, the man here, he doesn't, he doesn't even think about it, right? doesn't even think about it. His natural re reflex, his instinctual, automatic, mechanical, the very first thing he wants to do. Now watch this. He, we say it, we laugh at it, it's kind of cute. He, we say he blamed the woman, right? But just for a moment with me, go beyond the humor, Right? What is really taking place here? In a word, it's self-preservation at the expense of someone else. Self-preservation at the expense of someone else. That's what he's saying. He's basically saying, the woman that you gave to be with me, in other words, what he's doing here, he's throwing the woman under the bus. Right? That's what he's doing. All right? We just had it up on the screen a minute ago. Not all sin is murder, but all sin is murderous in its intent. Notice at this point, Adam feels that someone is going to pay for this. Someone's going to pay for this, and Adam has no problem taking this woman that he had formerly been in love with and showing her as a word of the lions. To say, hey, it's all about her. Here, right here, do with her. He wants her to be in the place of danger, the place of condemnation, the place of death, rather than himself. Rather than himself. It's all about self-preservation. The woman that you gave to be with me, she gave me the tree and I ate. Right? And the Lord said to, her, said to her, then, what is this that you have done? What is it have you done? And the woman again here, she doesn't have to think about it, right? The first two words out of her mouth, the serpent, 
The serpent, right? It's instinctual. It's natural. It's reflexive. She doesn't even have to think it through. Her natural desire now is for self-preservation. Self-preservation. Adam's natural desire is now for self-preservation at all costs to preserve one's self, no matter the cost. The emotional landscape I have here on the screen that happened there in Genesis chapter 3 with Adam and Eve is this. Shame, fear, covering, hiding, and then blaming. And this same, the same five things, the same emotional landscape, this has basically, basically been the ongoing story of humanity from that day to the present day. Every one of us, to, to a greater or lesser degree, wrestles with these very things that are right here on this screen. A while, a while back, I read a secular psychology book, and the author was putting forth the basic thesis that, that every single psychological pathology, everything that's, that's wrong with people and their thinking, all mental issues, not, not neurochemical, but thinking problems, all thinking problems, when, when people become depressed or when they become alienated, when they become all of those things, the author was putting forth the case that all of it stems at its most basic root from guilt. From guilt. That all psychological pathologies and all psychological disorders come from the inescapable, overwhelming, oppressive sense of guilt. And this goes straight back to Genesis 3. It's right there in Genesis 3. Many of you probably have friends and family who would think you are crazy for believing in the Bible. How many of us have those kind of people in our lives? Think you're just absolutely nuts that you believe the Bible is actually the Word of God. Right? I mean, we all do. That's crazy. Oh, man, that, that old book, that anger, that's, just, that's just myths. And that's, you know, that's, you might as well believe Greek mythology. People say it's crazy that they actually believe there's a God and you can talk to him and that he answers you. But let's be honest. Many people regard the Bible, many people regard the Bible, most people I would say nowadays regard the Bible as a classic example of delusion. Right? Made up fairy tale. It's basically self-medicating yourself with religion or whatever, right? A lot of people believe that. As Karl Marx famously said, religion is the opiate of the people. But for a book that is supposedly an opiate and supposedly outdated and supposedly dusty and antiquated, it sure does a very good job thousands of years ago putting its finger on the pulse of the basic issue with all humanity. Doesn't it? This is what we are facing. Facing shame, fear, Covering, hiding, and blaming. And you get this, by the way, only three chapters into the book. Three chapters in. I believe if all you had of the Bible was Genesis 1 through 3, we would have more than enough to be saved. We would have more than enough to be saved eternally. That doesn't mean we don't need the other 66 books. What it means is that there is such a wealth of information. Those early chapters, those embryonic chapters are just absolutely pregnant with meaning and significance. And, and, and many of us are, are living that reality. Now this raises a question, and this is the main point. There's only one point I want to get across to you today. What fundamentally has taken place in the Garden of Eden? What fundamentally took place? It's answerable in a very easy, single idea. And that is that a relationship of trust has been broken. A relationship of trust has been broken. Are you good with that? You say that's what basically what happened in the Garden of Eden? A relationship of trust has been... God had said, Adam and Eve, of every tree of the garden you may eat, right? Have at it. Have a great time, right? The name Garden of Eden, by the way, means garden of bliss or garden of pleasure. That's what it means. He said, have a blast, Right? The accuser shows up and says, no, it's not like that at all. You've been lied to. The whole situation has been misrepresented to you. It's not like that at all. Imagine this. Someone coming to you and saying, your father, maybe some of you have had a good dad. Imagine someone coming to you and saying, your dad, your dad's not who you think he is. Your mom is not who you think she is. Look at these pictures I have of your dad going into these places. Look at these pictures I have of your mom doing these things. Look at these emails I have from your, your dad or your mom. And all of a sudden, you would be in an emotional turmoil because the picture you think is an accurate one is now being undermined by this apparent evidence. Are you with me? The serpent presents this evidence and says, hey, what you think is happening is actually not happening. And I'm going to disclose to you the truth. I'm going to tell you the truth. 
And basically, that basic backdrop, what we end up with is a broken relationship. A broken relationship. Adam and Eve are faced with a choice, and the choice is, who do you trust, who do you believe? Do you believe God, or do you believe his accuser? Now that raises a question. The question is, how do you heal a broken relationship? How do you heal a broken relationship? Well, the first thing that it could clearly not be is with your strength, right? If you've had a falling out with your wife or falling out with your spouse or falling out with your children, you don't say, I'm going to get fit. I'm going to do a bunch of pull-ups and push-ups and crunches. I'm going to be so fit that my relationship is just going to come back together. Right? You're, 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 you're crazy. That's, that's not how it works. You cannot manhandle by strength or by physique or by fitness your relationships back into health and happiness and trust. Can you? It's not how it works. So how do you bring that relationship back together? Here's a great quotation I read um, from Desire of Ages. It says this, The exercise of force is contrary to the principle of God's government. Hallelujah. Thank goodness God is not like that. Amen? Forcing and coercing and manipulating his way in the world, he desires only the service of love. And love, you know this intuitively. You know this automatically. You, you know this. Love cannot be commanded. Can you say amen to that? It cannot be commanded. Love cannot be won by force or by authority. Well, how do you awaken love? How do you awaken trust? How do you heal a, a broken relationship? How does that take place? Only by love is love awakened. To know God is to love him. His character must be manifested in contrast to the character of Satan. So in answer to the question, how is this broken relationship, how is this disloyalty going to be put back together? It can't be by God's power. I want to underscore that right there. God can possess all the resources and all the omnipotence in the universe, which he does, by the way. In terms of basic physicality, God can do whatever he wants. But all the strength in the universe cannot put a relationship back together. That's not how it works. So how do you put a relationship back together? There is no quick fix for a broken relationship. It takes three things. Time, trust, and truth. And look at this sentence here. So God commits himself to the process. God commits himself to the process. God has been accused. He's the one being accused here. And he can't just come into the garden as much as he would have loved to do it and just snapped his fingers and fixed it all. Right? If that was the case, it would only be Genesis 1, 2, 3, and 4, and that's the end of the story. Right? If 4 would be the solution, it would be over. End of book. Four chapters, four pages. But what's the rest of Scripture about? you got, you got hundreds of pages of what? Of what? Of God committing himself to the process of winning back the trust and the love and the loyalty of his creation. That's what it's all about. In a word, do you know what that's called? What is it called when God commits himself to the process of winning back the trust, loyalty, and affection of his people? It's called covenant. It's called covenant. In a word that is called covenant, God covenants himself to his people. He covenants himself. I absolutely love this church. So I want you to know that. And I want to make sure that this is absolutely foundational for as long as I am pastor here. Everything in Scripture, everything in the Bible is understood against the backdrop of God's covenantal faithfulness to humanity. It's all understood against that. We've spent time already developing the idea in this series that the, re the reason for that is because God himself is a covenant. Remember, we've been over that. God is not a, a rigidity of singular, singular solo father who then somehow had a son and then the presence of both of them is somehow... The, no, 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 no. That's not what's taking place. And I know that some of you are inclined to believe that, but I respectfully and vigorously disagree with you. God himself is a family. Jesus himself introduced familial language when the disciples asked him, how do we pray? He said, pray like this, our Father. 
who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. The whole Bible is saturated with familial language, using words like the Son and the Father. And we have texts in the New Testament like, to as many as received him, to them he gave the right to be called the sons of God, the daughters of God. Texts that say things like, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the sons of God. Why all this familial language? Why all this covenantal language? Because God as a family, God God as a covenant, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a God who truly is love, a God who is love, that God covenants himself with humanity. And he relates to humanity over and over and over again on the basis of that covenant. That is the story of Scripture. Now in the Garden of Eden, Adam had a, had a covenant with God. And it was a covenant that basically was a covenant of obedience and trust. God said, you do this, I'll do this, right? By the way, uh, you know, he, he said, I've given you a garden, I've given you life, I've given you a body, I've given you a spouse, I've given you a companion, I, I've done this, this, that, this, you know, this is my part of the bargain. God's saying, like, I've done all this, right? Your part of the bargain is... Don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and be fruitful and multiply. That's it. That's it. Like Adam's contract is like a page. God's just like, this is what I'm doing, right? Don't eat of that tree, be fruitful and multiply. That is it. That's a fairly modest request, right? Have lots of kids and stay away from that tree. It's, it's, I mean, that, think about that. You understand this. But that modest request was violated there, when that was violated, there was a disloyalty there. there. There was a disruption of the relationship. And so the covenant between God and Adam was broken. The covenant between God and Adam was broken. Adam tried to fix the covenant by patching himself up. Eve tried to patch herself up. When the patching up didn't work, they tried to fix it by shoving someone else in front of the bus. It was the woman you gave me. And God's like, yeah, let's get her out of the picture, and then, then you and I will be good. No. No. And they're actually, trying to, they're actually trying to keep the covenant. I want, you, I want to say a quick word on this. I, I want you to understand this. Every one of us, I believe, is born with a sense of morality. We're born with a, an internal sense of justice. All of us. I don't care where in the world you're born, what period of history you're born, what you're growing up being taught. If you've never read the Bible, you don't know anything about God. We are all born with an internal sense of morality and justice. All of us have a kind of internal, inborn sense of right and wrong. C.S. Lewis illustrates this brilliantly in his book, Mere Christianity. If you've never read it, I encourage you to do so. He says, for example, that there is a line. Maybe we are waiting to go into a museum or something, and there is a line of 100 people. If someone comes and cuts in line, what is your response if someone tries to cut in front of you? Do you say, hey, come on in? Is it an injustice to you, but it's an injustice to all the people behind you, Right? Are you with me? So Lewis uses this illustration where he says, hey, if someone tries to cut in the line, if someone protests and say, hey, that's not cool, that's not right, you can't just do that. Well, what the person who is cutting will not say is, well, <coughs> screw your standards, right? What the person tries to do is show that they are actually in compliance with the standard. They'll say something like this, oh, well, you know, she was saving my place, right? Now, don't miss this. In other words, we both agree that cutting in line is wrong. Cutting in line is wrong. I'm just showing you that I'm in basic compliance with the standard. Right? Or the person might say, oh, I was already here earlier, but I had to go and get something from my car. I'm just coming back to the place I already had. You ever hear that one? The argument that is taking place is with the basic understanding that we agree what is right and just and fair. Adam and Eve knew good and well that a covenant had been broken. They knew it. And intuitively, they had a sense, I've got to make it right. I've got to make it right. I'll, I'll cover myself. That'll make it right. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll put Eve out there. That'll make it right. I'll put the serpent out there. That'll make it right. I'll hide from the presence of God. That will make it right. And God basically shows up in the garden and says, you can't make it right. You can't make it right. The only one that can make this right is me. Is me. And I'm going to show you how I'm going to make it right. 
That's the story of Adam and Eve. By the way, then God makes a covenant later with Noah. Look really quick with me, Genesis chapter 6, he says these words, But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall go into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. Now there's a lot that's going on here. The, the short version is that Noah, according to Moses, who wrote the book of Genesis, is like the second Adam, okay? And, and I could spend a lot of time developing that, but I'm just going to give you like the 60-second version. When God or, uh, originally created in Genesis chapters 1 and 2, the first thing that he did is he created a space in the waters. It says that God separated the waters that were above from the waters that were beneath. God then begins to create a series of spaces. He creates the land space, he creates the air space, and he creates the water space, and then he goes back and he fills those spaces, okay? He fills the air with things, he fills the land with things, he fills the water with things. This is basically Genesis 1 and 2. Make a space and fill it with things. A very interesting thing happens in the flood. A very interesting thing. After Adam and Eve have sinned and a series of successive generations have become so sinful, so, so messed up, so depraved, that God basically says we got to start over. Think about that. I, just, I mean, that's, that's crazy. What, what he does is an interesting thing. He closes that space. Where before he had created a space, the waters above and the waters below, Scripture says that in the flood, Genesis chapter 6, the windows of heaven were opened. In other words, water came down, and then it says the fountains of the deep burst forth. In other words, water came up. What you have here is water coming from the top and water coming from the bottom. And when the whole earth is covered, what you have is basically a watery mass. A watery mass. Well, that's exactly what you have in Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness covered the face of the deep. When God begins in creation, he starts with a watery mass. That's the first thing he does. Right? When God recreates with Noah, he recreates the watery mass. And Noah is his man, just as Adam was his man. Now Noah is his guy. Noah is his guy. In Genesis 9:20, it says Noah was a farmer. Literally, what it says in the Hebrew is Noah was an earth man. That's what it says. Noah was an earth man. Now let me ask you: who was the first earth man? Exactly. God started with a watery mass, and he started with an earth man. And he started over with a watery mass, and he started over with an earth man. Guess what the first earth man uh, fell by, by taking part illegitimately of the fruit of the garden? The second earth man, think about this. The first Adam, he ate of the fruit. That's how he fell. The second earth man falls, the Bible says, by taking part illegitimately of the fruit of, the, of the, his vine and, and getting drunk. You with me? There's all these fascinating little parallels here. We don't have time to go into all of them. You have a beginning with Adam. You have a new beginning with Noah. Okay? God makes a covenant with Noah, and Noah breaks covenant with God. He kept covenant in a sense. He made the ark. He was faithful. He put the animals on the ark. He put himself on the ark, put his family on the ark. But just as Adam had broken covenant with God, now Noah broke covenant with God. Noah broke the covenant too. The Bible then races, and we're going to spend more time on this next time. The book of Genesis has a fascinating basic architecture. The book of Genesis is 50 chapters. The first 11 chapters cover 2,000 years of history. 2,000 years in 11 chapters, and we basically know nothing about it. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you right now. 11 chapters cover 2,000 years. We know about that much of what took place in those 2,000 years. We don't know that much. Here's what we do know. Creation, the first murder, the flood, the Tower of Babel. That's basically it. That's basically it. 2,000 years, and you, you know like six things, right? Six stories. In other words, you know almost nothing about early, early, early earth. None of us do. We really don't. So you go through the first 11 chapters of the Bible, you got 2,000 years of earth's history, and then Moses, who wrote the book of Genesis, he's almost racing through these first 11 chapters it's just as, as fast as he possibly can, and then you get to Genesis chapters 12 through 50, and the whole thing just slows way down. Slows way down, right? The first 11 chapters of Genesis cover 2,000 years of history. The last 39 chapters cover approximately 200 years of history. Think about that. Just let that sink in. 11 chapters, 2,000 years. 39 chapters, 200 years. Moses can't tell the history of earth fast enough. It's almost like he's, he's put it all on fast forward, right? Just a few events, creation, fl flood, Tower of Babel, Abraham, right? He's racing to get to the story of Abraham. That's what he's doing. He's racing to get there. He can't wait to get there. 
Now the Lord had said to Abram, Genesis chapter 12, Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. I'm going to translate this for you. God basically says, Abraham, you're my man. You're my guy, right? You're the guy through whom I'm going to save the whole world. You're the guy. I'm going to say the whole world through you. I'm going to do something through you and through your family that is going to put the whole world back to right. I made a covenant with Adam. It was broken. I made a covenant with Noah. It was broken. Abraham, you're my guy, and I'm going to make a covenant with you. I'm going to make a covenant with you. Abraham and his descendants later become Israel, by the way. And the story from Genesis chapters 12 throughout the rest of Scripture is the story of God's covenant with Abraham and the descendants of Abraham. The rest of Scripture. The story of your Bible that you hold in your hands. People say, what's the Bible really about? People give a lot of nice sounding but really incorrect answers. The story of Scripture is the story of God making a covenant with a man named Abraham and with his descendants. That's what the story of Scripture is about. And then the story of God keeping that covenant and the descendants of Abraham breaking it. That's the story. God keeping it and us breaking it over and over and over again. Many of you have been reading your Bible for years and you didn't even know the story you were reading. We've all been there, haven't we? You knew parts of the story. You knew actors in the play. You knew scenes in the play. But I'm telling you today the big picture. All of it is about God restoring his covenant to humanity through a guy called Abraham. We're going to end with this. There's no quick fix for a broken relationship. It takes time. It takes trust. It takes truth. You need someone to deal truthfully with you. You need someone that's trustworthy and can trust you. You need someone that, that takes time with you. If there is a wounded relationship, you can't just put that thing back together, can you? Guys, by the way, we're, we're kind of the guilty party on this most of the time. We, we think we can fix something that's been months in the making because for one day we're on good behavior, right? <laughs> that, I'm, I'm guilty of that, guys, let's be honest. We get offended when our spouse wants a pattern of demonstration that we're going to live a certain way now, Right? Think, yeah, sure, it took me 10 years to get it wrong, but I'm going to get it right in 10 minutes. Right? Only by love is love awakened. Only by love is love awakened. As we continue our study, we're moving from the, the, the rind of religion into the juicy, sweet goodness of understanding who God really is. I've heard so many testimonies of people saying, I have known about God my whole life, but I am just now coming to know God personally. And as, as we move, many of us, from the rind of religion into the juicy, sweet goodness of an actual, personal, real, authentic, growing, dynamic relationship with God. A relationship, by the way, that is not only fostered in church on Sabbath morning for an hour. But it's fostered in, in small groups and families and community and, and it's fostered in doing ministry. I'm telling you, wait until you get to the inside of that orange. If you think the outside is good, wait till you get to the inside. Many of you are feasting on the outside and you're absolutely loving it. You're loving it. We want this church, I want this church to be a safe place where people can come. Where they can have their lives restored. Where they can have their relationships restored. We want this to be a safe place where people can encounter the living God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Have you ever thought about how crazy that is, by the way? That in Scripture, God, think about this, God... The infinite, illimitable, eternal God of the universe. Do you know how he chooses to be called the most in the Bible? He says, hey, 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 I'm, I'm Abraham's God. Oh, I, I'm Isaac's God. I'm Jacob's God. You see, God is so identified with that basic relationship, with that covenant, that he calls his name the name of his sincere and earnest followers. He says over and over and over again in the Old Testament, I'm the God of Abraham. I'm the God of Isaac. I'm the God of Jacob. I'm the relational God. I'm the covenantal God. I am the God that is going to put the world right. Not by my, my might, not by my strength, but by my love, my faithfulness, and my goodness. God wants to put your life back together. He wants to put my life back together. He wants to put our families back together. He wants to put our, our communities back together. And ultimately, ultimately, God is putting the whole world back together. Let's pray. Father, it's incredible when you pause and reflect on just who you are. 
it's too easy. It's too easy to believe the accusations of the accuser. So many people do. So many so-called Christians do. We don't even believe you when you tell us who you really are. Father, my prayer for everyone here, myself included, is that we would see you for who you really are. That we would believe you and take you at your word. And that we would not believe the lies of the accuser. And as a result of us understanding who you are, seeing the big picture, understanding our relationship to you, as a result of that, that we would be ambassadors for the family of God to everybody else around us. That we'd be so transformed that we would, we would see ourselves the way that you see us, not the way we've always seen ourselves. And because of that, we would see other people the way you see them as well. And we would treat other people the way that you've treated us. And we would forgive other people the way you've forgiven us. We would love people the way that you've loved us. All this is only possible through your you residing in us, changing us, transforming us. We invite you in this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name.